I imagine you're probably like me as a as a young child. I remember I remember being prejudiced against certain people. I think it's something that happens to really everyone. Um, I don't think it's an uncommon thing at all. Um, and I think at various stages of people's lives, we just are prejudiced toward certain other groups of people. It happens because we're taught to be prejudiced. Some people from the moment they're born are, are literally raised and taught to, to be prejudiced toward other people. It happens because we, we learn it by observation. We watch other people treat certain other people in a particular way, and we think, oh, that's how you treat those people. <coughs> that's what it means to be this kind of person. As a child, I was prejudiced toward Americans who live in the North. We Southerners are the true Americans. You probably don't know that. I know Randy knows that. We, we, we Southerners are the true Americans. Yankees, as we call all of you growing up, when I was growing up, Yankees couldn't be trusted. Not just because they like the Yankee baseball team, although that's bad enough, right, in and of itself. Too bad Jim's not here this morning, but, you know, that's okay. I was prejudiced because of my surrounding circumstances, right? I was taught that Southerners are real Americans, right? This is, this is where real America is in the South, which, of course, is a complete load of what we would call hogwash, but, you know, that's, that's what people say there. I may have told you the story, may have, or maybe just some of you, but when Rachel and I decided to move up here and join you in this ministry, a former elder at, at the, the, the previous church I was with, um, so he had been an elder almost up until we left, but he heard that we were going to be moving out here, and he had to come by and see he wanted to talk to me. Okay, yeah, uh, go on by and, and, and let's talk. He called me. So he wanted to catch up in general, see how we were doing, right? Because a big move is difficult. Um, but he, he really had a different agenda on his mind. He wanted to try to dissuade me from actually moving up here, even though we'd already agreed to move up here and, and take the job. He told me, they, meaning you all, are not like us. Going to work up there is going to be very different. <coughs> I replied with something like, okay, how are people up there really all that different? Do they have different sorts of problems than people in Oklahoma do? Which, of course, he, you know, took my point, I mean, pretty quickly and backed off, but he had to come and let me know, may not want to go to the north. They're not like us Southerners. You can see how that, that prejudice just it sits on people, right? And it's hard to let go. It's hard to let go of the prejudice we have in our heart. We're taught, again, from a very young age, to, to think a certain way about other kinds of people. In Acts chapter 10 and 11, we see some prejudice. We see Peter's prejudice in particular. Peter has kept himself from the Gentiles. And he's going to go on to say that that's what he's supposed to do, even though in the Old Testament there's actually no teaching to not associate with Gentiles. But Peter's one of those good Jews. One of those Jews who goes the extra step to, to really set himself apart from all the other peoples of the world. And now, now he's being asked to throw his prejudice aside. He's being asked to get rid of this thing that he's long held and believed to be true. So let's read from Acts chapter 10 and 11 and see what happens with him and what we might can learn from Peter. Beginning in verse 1 of Acts chapter 10, the word of the Lord. And Caesarea there lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius, who was a captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. He gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. One afternoon, about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming toward him. Cornelius, the angel said. Cornelius stared at him in terror. What is it, sir? He asked the angel. And the angel replied, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. 
Now send some men to Joppa, and summon a man named Simon Peter. He is staying with Simon, a tanner who lives near the seashore. As soon as the angel was gone, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier, one of his personal attendants. He told them what had happened and sent them off to Joppa. The next day, as Cornelius' messengers were nearing the town, Peter went up on the flat roof to pray. It was about noon, and he was hungry. But while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the sky open, and something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners. In the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles, and birds. Then a voice said to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat them. No, Lord, Peter declared, I have never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. But the voice spoke again, Do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. Meanwhile, as Peter was puzzling over the vision, the Holy Spirit said to him, Three men have come looking for you. Get up and go downstairs and go with them without hesitation. Don't worry, for I have sent them. They arrived in Caesarea the following day. Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered his home, Cornelius fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter pulled him up and said, Stand up. I'm a human being, just like you. So they talked together and went inside, where many others were assembled. Peter told them, You know it is against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with you. But God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. Then Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. This is the message of good news for the people of Israel, that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after John began preaching his message of baptism. And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles too, for they heard them speaking in other tongues in praise of God. And Peter asked, Can anyone object to their being baptized now that they have received the Holy Spirit just as we did? So he gave orders for them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Afterward, Cornelius asked him to stay with them for several days. Soon the news reached the apostles and other believers in Judea, and the Gentiles had received that the Gentiles had received the word of God. But when Peter arrived back in Jerusalem, the Jewish believers criticized him. You entered the home of Gentiles and even ate with them, they said. As I began to speak, Peter continued, Holy Spirit fell on them, just as he fell on, all, fell on us at the beginning. Then I thought of the Lord's words when he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And since God gave these Gentiles the same gift he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to stand? God's way. When the others heard this, they stopped objecting and began praising God. They said, we can see that God has also given the Gentiles the privilege of repenting of their sins and receiving eternal life. It's a beautiful story. Powerful story. A story of Peter learning to overcome his prejudice. So let's talk about it today. Let's talk about the conversion of Cornelius here. But we have to begin with the visions. <clears throat> we begin chapter 10 with Cornelius, with the, a description of him, that he is a Roman army officer, a Roman centurion, stationed in Caesarea. Now, this was an incredibly important port city for the empire. So as such, for him to be stationed there would have meant that he was well-trusted, well-respected, somebody of high renown within the Empire's army. But we know more about him than just that, just that he's a good army officer. He's also a God-fearing man, and so is his household. He's taught them to be <coughs> God-fearing as well. I wonder if Luke is trying to 
recall for us the other Roman centurion that he spoke about in Luke chapter, wrote about rather, in Luke chapter 7. The one who loved the Jews so deeply, remember that he did what for them? He built them a synagogue. Whether he wants us to make this connection or not, this man, Cornelius, is remarkable in his own right. He's generous with his money toward those who need it, toward the poor. And he prays regularly to God. And it was actually at one of these regularly prescribed moments of prayer at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We see this twice. We see at 3 o'clock in the afternoon is when Cornelius receives his vision. On the next day at noon, another prescribed moment for prayer. They prayed about every three hours throughout the day is when Peter received his vision. So the fact that Luke explicitly tells us when he's praying tells us that this man was a devout, God-fearing person, that he even followed those regularly prescribed times and moments of prayer. Now, this is something that's kind of got gone out of uh, uh, style, probably not the right word, but with Christians, we don't tend to follow a strictly regimented you know, prayer schedule. But there are some Christians who do. There are other religions who do, that they follow. They regularly prescribe uh, um, times of prayer. That's what's happening here with Cornelius, a Gentile following the Jewish times of prayer. So it's at one of these times of prayer, at three o'clock in the afternoon, that he receives his vision from the Lord. He listens and responds immediately to the Lord's request. He didn't hesitate at all. He didn't question. He didn't wonder, okay, what's really going on here? Does he really want me to do this? No, he, he gets up immediately, and he sends his servants to find Peter. If there's one thing that is just consistent throughout Acts so far, as, as we've been reading that I've picked up on, it's that the people Luke highlights for us are always quick to action when God makes a request. It's just been consistent through these first 11 chapters. When God asks somebody to do something in Acts, Luke tells us they did it immediately, without hesitation, boldly stepping out in faith. Cornelius is the same way, yet he's not a Jew. This is a man who has no business doing what he's doing, and yet here he is anyway. There's no second guessing from him, no backpedaling, no moment of hesitation. And I wonder... Can we learn to live the same way that Cornelius did? Can we truly be ready to act when God calls us? Or might we hesitate when we shouldn't? On the next day, Peter received his own vision about Cornelius and the people that were coming for him. And here is the other moment that I spoke about last week from chapter 9, when Ananias and Saul received the concurrent <coughs> visions, right? Ananias received a vision about Paul. Paul received a vision about Ananias. Now it's Peter and Cornelius that, uh, receiving these visions. While the one this week is ready to act, Peter, on the other hand, is not so certain, right? Peter initially questions whether he should follow through with the vision he's seeing. He doesn't understand it because his mind has been warped so that he can't understand it initially. The Spirit shows him this plethora of unclean animals, right? And he's supposed to get up and kill them, and he, Peter refuses. It's not that he hesitates. It's not that he wonders or questions why. It's, no, I'm not doing that. I have never done that, and I never will do that. This is brash Peter coming out again, right? The one that we know so well. Peter only has eyes in this moment to see the situation one particular way. The way that he's always seen it. The way that he's been taught to see it. He doesn't see the situation as God sees it. But, he learns quickly, he's told not to call something unclean if God himself has made it clean. It's one of the most incredibly powerful statements I think that we can read in Scripture. What it does for me every time I read it is remind me that I make all kinds of assumptions, that we make all kinds of assumptions about knowing 
precisely what God wants or what God is thinking. We do this all the time. That we assume that we know the mind and the heart of God. And maybe, just maybe, we are in fact wrong. That maybe the things that we are prejudiced against, but we do it in the name of God, are actually things that God would turn back around on us and say, what you're calling unclean, I have not declared unclean. Maybe we should stop assuming that we see as perfectly as God sees. Could it be that we're in that same boat as Peter? That we're looking at the world in a way that we think God is looking at it, but that we're actually wrong. I know we don't enjoy being wrong. None of us enjoy being wrong. None of us want to imagine that we could possibly be wrong. We hate that. We don't like being wrong. But I'm here to tell you this morning, you're probably wrong about a lot. As am I. Can we admit that? Are we willing to admit that? We love imagining that we understand and interpret the Bible perfectly and without error. We love that. I know what this says. I don't need anybody to tell me what this says. I can just read it, and then I know what it says. But could it be that God is trying to get us to change our minds as he had to change Peter's mind? Let's talk a little bit more about Cornelius and his household and their baptism. In verse 34, we see one of the main points of theology for Luke and Paul in both of their writings. You can see this all over. That God does not show partiality. For those of us who are, are have been coming to class on Sunday mornings, I've been talking about Romans. We're in Romans chapter 1. This is a big point of Paul's in Romans. That the gospel, the good news about Jesus, is for everyone. For the Jew first, but also for the Gentile. That God does not favor one person or one group over another. It's true that God has chosen and probably will choose again a person or a group of people through which he's going to act to bring about his purposes. But that choosing doesn't entail favoritism, as Luke tells us right here. As Peter says in verse 35, it's about fearing God and doing right. The one who does those things is able to accept the good news of Jesus, and for whom the good news of Jesus has a lasting and profound impact. So we see that for Peter, Jesus takes a central stage in his message of the good news. That because of Jesus, there is peace with God. Did you, did you hear him say that? There is peace with God. And it's a truth that is only possible because of Jesus, this, this peace that can come upon us. There's no other way to experience the peace Peter is experiencing, and that he wants others to experience as well. And so now that peace is finally available, yes, even to the Gentiles, even for us. And you can see how Peter is working out this logic in his head since he left Simon's house after seeing the vision, what it's ultimately going to mean as he approaches Cornelius' house. Though the way has been open for the Gentiles, Peter and his companions still need to experience that the Gentiles are truly welcome in God's family. So, what happens upon reaching his home? The Holy Spirit does exactly what the Holy Spirit needs to do to prove to Peter uh, what he's already seen in a vision, right? The Holy Spirit makes it abundantly clear that Peter and the Jewish Christians need to drop their attitude, need to drop their prejudice, and view that the Gentiles are unclean, are welcome in God's family. So the Holy Spirit shows up in a powerful way and confirms beyond a shadow of a doubt that Cornelius and his household are welcome in God's family. And his leadership, Peter's leadership in this moment, is decisive, it's quick, and it's necessary. His response to the Holy Spirit's arrival is to obey God's obvious guidance and fully incorporate the Gentiles into the church without hesitation, right? He doesn't waste a moment. They get the Holy Spirit, 
Okay, cool. We got some water here. Let's baptize them. That's what needs to happen next. All objections are thrown out the window. Every, every excuse they could have given before is gone. It's just not there any longer. And this same sort of question, we actually saw with the Ethiopian eunuch by himself about himself. He says, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? That's Peter's question here in Acts chapter 11. We have water. Let's baptize these people. Why shouldn't they be baptized now that they've received the Holy Spirit? These Gentiles, Peter says, should enjoy full acceptance into God's family. Right now, the same way that Jewish Christians have been doing upon their belief and acceptance of Jesus. And so they get baptized, Cornelius and his household. Such an amazing event, right? An amazing event. It would surely be met with unheralded joy and exuberance and excitement and every other, you know, word that you can think of that means is a synonym with excitement, right? Well, no. We all know that's wrong. And partly because I read it a moment ago, but we all just know that's wrong. That's not how things work out. Peter, upon returning to Jerusalem, what happened with him? As he's telling the story to the apostles and the other believers there, what happens? Well, wait, wait a minute, Peter. You're actually telling me you were in a home with Gentiles? You ate with them? You bat... Hold on, Peter. This can't be true, right? I mean, they, they just can't believe that Peter would do this thing. It's a human condition for us to reject and question what we don't understand or immediately like. We don't like change. We struggle to change. We struggle when things are different than the way that we want them to be or the way that we expect them to be, the way that we anticipate them to be. We struggle with change. The most difficult change of all, religious change. It is the most difficult change that you can experience to go from thinking one way about something in your life, religiously, theologically, to thinking a different way about that. That is one of, if not the most difficult changes a person can make. It is one of the reasons that conversion for so many people eludes them. Because they just can't give up their life and change who they are to be, you know, a believer in Jesus. Because the demands that Jesus is going to make on their life, they don't want to give up, right? There's, there's so much of that. But it's also for us who have been Christians for a while to change the way we think about other things, about other people, and to see them God's way. That kind of change, that's what Peter's going through now. That's what the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem are going through now. They only envision the Gentiles as one way. They have to meet these expectations. And now that they don't, what do we do with that? We, you mean we have to change our whole way of thinking about them? The people that we've declared unclean for millennia, we now have to accept this. Clean? Change is difficult. Religious change the most difficult. But as Gamaliel once said when counseling his fellow Jewish leaders back in Acts chapter 5 and verse 39, do you remember what he said? If it is from God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You may even find yourselves, what, fighting against God? Do you remember Gamaliel saying this? The same response that Peter has to the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem upon his arrival. Who was I to stand in God's way? When God declares these people clean, who am I to stand in the way of God? <clears throat> I imagine this was one of the most difficult moments of Peter's life. For him to change so drastically from Thinking one way about the Gentiles to thinking a completely different way must have been incredibly difficult. But he 
He did it because it was the right thing to do. Because it was the necessary thing to do. Because the good news of Jesus wasn't going to be stopped just because Peter couldn't get his mind around the fact that God was accepting this whole other group of people that they had been discounting. Who are we to stand in God's way? Are we ready to change our mind, our thoughts, our way of thinking if God is asking us to? A couple of things to take away from these two chapters to end with. If God asked you, there we go, there we go. If God asked you to do something for him today, no matter what it is, would you be ready to do it? Cornelius, as soon as he got the vision, was, okay, cool, I'm sending a couple people. I gotta go find Peter. I need to get him back here because apparently there's something that I need to learn. There's something that I need to experience. No hesitation, no second guessing, just I gotta get this done because God's asking me. We have that same sort of attitude and mentality. If God is asking us to do something, or oh, okay, God, I'll get to it when I get to it. And I kind of ready, but if you could just give me like ten more years, then I'll then I'll be ready to, to help you out there. But be ready to respond to what God is asking of us. And the second thing. This is a really hard question for me to, to write down this week. Uh, I struggle even putting it down, but it seems like a necessary one. Could we be standing in God's way? Is there progress that God is asking us to make as an individual, as a church, as Christians? Mm-hmm. If you're standing in the way of God right now, how would we even know? Would we respond once we know? How would we respond to that change? Gamaliel and the other Jewish leaders found themselves standing in the way of God. And pretty quickly. Uh, I mean, their objections, I mean, they didn't matter anymore, right? This, this movement could not be stopped. Just flat out could not be stopped. Peter found himself standing in God's way. Until he didn't any longer. Until God forced him to see what I have declared clean, you don't get to declare unclean. Could we be standing in God's way? That's the good news I wanted to talk about this morning from 10 of 11. Powerful chapters. This story is so rich with content, with, with depth and meaning and purpose for us if we're willing to listen. family time now is a time where we get to share together. A time to pray for each other, to support each other. I know we've got several people um, uh, in, in, our, in our church that are, are struggling uh, with physical illness. We've got people out traveling. What do we need to pray for this morning? We want you to come share that with us because we want to support each other. It's what a family does. We support each other. Maybe you've got something joyful to share, some good news that you want to let us know about this morning. We want to hear those too. So whatever needs you have that you want to bring before us, come let us know as we stay on the scene.